On this Monday night, what happened inside a Quebec care home? The disturbing details and the owner's fight to stop a public inquiry. Denouncing arbitrary detentions of foreign nationals. I want to congratulate Canada for spearheading this initiative. The international declaration aimed at China. Protesters in Myanmar threatened with prison time. But they refused to give up their demands for democracy. Plus, the growing online forums for black people. A lot of white people aren't used to being the minority, so they don't understand how important it is to have your own space. The need for safe spaces. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin with the push to protect Canada's most vulnerable from another deadly wave of COVID-19. Across the country, public health authorities say they're making progress in getting vaccines into long-term care facilities. In some regions, officials say there's already proof the inoculations are having an impact. We've also seen a notable decrease in transmission and outbreaks in long-term care and assisted living facilities as immunization has rolled out. And this is clear evidence of the effectiveness of the vaccines and extremely encouraging news. For so many Canadian families, the vaccine rollout is too little too late. According to the National Institute on Aging, more than 14,000 Canadians in long-term care have died of the virus. Of those, more than 7,600 were in Quebec. One of the province's hardest-hit facilities was Heron on Montreal's West Island. Dozens died in horrible conditions. Now a coroner's inquiry is underway to determine what went so wrong. Mike Armstrong has tonight's top story. The inquiry started basically with a warning from the coroner. Yann Kamel says the proceedings will be emotional for families who lost loved ones and called for respect. Now, the plan is to begin the inquiry with three days looking at the Heron residence in Dorval. 47 people died in the first wave of the pandemic in that one long-term care facility. The conditions inside the coroner calls indecent and inhumane. In those first weeks, the staff was overwhelmed and most left. Residents went for days without being cleaned or properly fed. This social worker volunteered to help and described the chaos inside. There is a smell in there and it's a smell of the deceased and of wounds that need to be taken care of. The goal of the inquiry is to figure out what happened, to understand the mistakes. To do that, it'll have to determine the role COVID-19 played and the role negligence may have played. Lawyer Patrick Martin Menard represents four of the victims. A lot has been said, a lot has been written about what has been going on, but this is the first really public proceeding in which we will really be able to ask the key decision makers the questions. Now, the inquiry was supposed to hear witnesses on day one. That didn't happen. Instead, it was a day of legal wrangling. The lawyers for the owners of the Heron residence are asking the hearings be delayed or covered by a publication ban. They say there's a criminal investigation underway and their clients may face charges over how the outbreak was handled. If the inquiry goes on, the lawyers say it could be prejudicial against their clients. The coroner suspended and will hand down a decision Tuesday. If it does continue, the inquiry will look at other residences in the coming months. Quebec recently passed 10,000 deaths since the start of the pandemic. About 70% were in long-term care centres. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. In Ontario, public health officials are going to extraordinary lengths to try to contain an outbreak of a variant first detected in South Africa. Today, health workers went floor by floor at a Mississauga condo building, offering everyone testing after five people in the building tested positive for the variant. And in Newfoundland and Labrador, the chief medical health officer is urging people to be vigilant after an outbreak of the variant first discovered in the UK. The province says seven more people have tested positive for the virus and 21 others are presumed infected. There are now 298 active cases in that province. New COVID-19 rules are now in effect at Canada's land border crossings. As of today, non-essential travelers crossing the U.S. border into Canada must provide proof of a negative COVID-19 test taken within the last 72 hours. People who do not comply face fines of up to $3,000 or criminal prosecution. And starting February 22nd, travelers arriving by land and air must also take a COVID-19 test 
upon arrival. After weeks of setbacks and shortages, it appears Canada's vaccine deliveries are finally set to ramp up. According to the Federal Public Health Agency, Canada should get more than 400,000 doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine this week. That would be the biggest shipment from that drug company so far. The next batch of Moderna doses is scheduled to arrive next week. The government says it's expecting 168,000 doses. That's tens of thousands less than what was initially promised. Canada's vaccine supply could soon get a boost from India's Serum Institute. On Twitter today, the CEO of the Indian vaccine maker said doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine will be en route to Canada in less than a month. Last week, India's Prime Minister told our Prime Minister that India would do its best to supply Canada with doses. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is not yet approved for use in Canada. In the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is applauding the nation's unprecedented vaccination rollout. At least 15 million people have had their first COVID-19 shot, and now the next phase begins. But Johnson is tempering expectations to help ease Britain out of lockdown. The number of people in hospitals suffering from severe forms of the virus is higher now than in the first wave of the pandemic. Here's our Europe Bureau Chief, Crystal Gumansing, with the health crisis in one of the world's hardest hit regions. With health officials moving on to a new vaccination priority group, 65 to 69 year olds, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has reason to be cheerful. If you look at what's happened in the last few weeks, it's been an unbelievable effort by uh, the NHS. National Health Service workers, pharmacists and members of the military have all been instrumental in the UK reaching its goal of 15 million jabs by mid-month. But the threat of the virus has not been eased. British nationals arriving from red list countries, mostly in South America and Africa, are now being whisked off to 16 different quarantine hotels. We will be calling every guest every day just to check if there's anything we can get them, if there's anything we can do for them, if there's any concerns that they have. Uh, but in addition to that, there's also a welfare call uh, provided by government. Imported infections are of great concern because of virus variants. Any positive test from a traveller will undergo genomic sequencing. The more transmissible variant first discovered in the UK led to a third lockdown for England. As the government praises its vaccination achievements, it's countering calls to reopen, saying a timeline will be shared next week. I mean, for me, making sure that we, oh, you know, as we lift measures, we do so carefully and cautiously to make sure that we don't have to put them on again. Rates of infection, although they're coming down, uh, are still comparatively high. So we've got to be very uh, prudent. Right, this is the moment. Prudent, but positive, says Johnson, that things are moving in the right direction. Crystal Gamancing, Global News, London. The federal government has assembled a coalition of allies to denounce state-sponsored arrests of four nationals for political purpose. This is the strongest stance taken by Ottawa since the detention of two Canadians in China. The initiative is earning praise around the world. But as our chief political correspondent David Aiken reports, key countries are holding out. Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig have now been in Chinese prisons for 798 days, put there following the arrest in Canada of Meng Wanzhou, the chief financial officer of Chinese telecom giant Huawei, who is wanted by the U.S. on fraud charges. Ever since the two Michaels were detained, Canada has been putting whatever diplomatic pressure it can on China, and Monday's declaration may be its most significant move yet. I'm grateful and emboldened by the strong show of support here. Today, countries from every continent stand together to tell people who are being arbitrarily detained abroad that they are not alone. The Canadian-led declaration is endorsed by 58 countries, including every other G7 member. We need leadership from rights respecting democracies if the rule of law is to be restored and promoted around the world. So I want to congratulate Canada for spearheading this initiative. But only two countries from China's neighborhood, Japan and Australia, would endorse the declaration. 
Canada is working to have others sign it too. It's a very important initiative and Canadians have been waiting uh, quite a long time for something uh, like this from the Canadian government and this one is a really big deal. As for China, even though it is not named in the declaration, it appeared to get the hint and reacted harshly. Through its media mouthpiece, the Global Times, the Chinese government let it be known, it considers the declaration, quote, an aggressive and ill-considered attack designed to provoke China, and that Canada's chosen diplomatic approach has never worked before and will not achieve any goal in the future. Everybody's watching China now to see what their reaction is going to be, whether they will change their practices. We all hope that they will. Um, and that's the purpose of this whole initiative. The next step for Canada is to develop some enforcement mechanisms to try to put a little teeth into this declaration and to keep the pressure on China. Robin? David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks, David. The impeachment trial of former U.S. President Donald Trump may be over, but Trump has signaled that he wants to remain an active force in American politics. As Jackson Prosco reports, with or without Trump, Republicans now have to figure out what kind of party they want to be. On this President's Day, Washington is still under tight guard. Fearing more political uncertainty at the hands of a newly exonerated Donald Trump. You will have no respect for this kind of soft norm of, of past presidents letting their successors um, do their job without interference. Donald Trump's not going to care about that. Immediately following his acquittal, Trump told followers our historic, patriotic and beautiful movement to make America great again has only just begun, setting up a battle between pro-Trump Republicans and those who just want to move on. The Republicans need to think about, do we want to be a mainstream party or are we going to fragment? Most Republican voters have gone all in on Trump, believing his lie about a stolen election. A poll found 66% of Republicans believe Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. 55% support the idea of using force to slow what they see as a decline in the traditional American way of life. His legacy will be certainly a permanent change of the Republican Party to becoming a more nationalist, populist party. There are signs Trump is no longer welcome by the party brass and won't find many friends if he faces criminal charges. Still liable for everything he did while he's in office. Didn't get away with anything yet. There are investigations underway into Trump's financial dealings, his attempts to overturn election results in Georgia and his role in inciting the mob that stormed the Capitol. Any one of which could make Trump a political liability for a party in recovery mode. For now, it seems Republicans are banking on Trump and his supporters to help them out in the 2022 midterms. But whether the former president decides to mount a comeback in 2024 is still a big unknown and will continue to hang over the party until he makes up his mind about what he's going to do next. Robin? Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thanks, Jackson. Nearly 170 million Americans are in the path of a vicious weather system that has caused some states to either declare disasters or states of emergency. An unusually wide band of frigid air has triggered snow and ice from Seattle down to the deep south. And there are areas not used to extreme cold. In Dallas, where the temperature usually hovers around 6 degrees Celsius this time of year, it dipped to minus 13. Rolling power blackouts have been ordered across Texas. In Oklahoma, people are also being asked to conserve electricity through the cold snap. A huge winter storm dumped heavy snow right across that state. Demonstrators defied the military's orders in Myanmar. Coming up, the potential punishment if they don't get off the streets. The military in Myanmar, also known as Burma, is using a new weapon to crack down on protesters. The junta imposed a law that threatens up to 20 years in prison for anyone convicted of obstructing the armed forces. Armored vehicles and soldiers are patrolling the streets, but demonstrators remain defiant, fighting for the return of the country's fragile democracy. Redmond Shannon reports. 
two weeks since the military coup and the signs of unrest are only increasing in Myanmar. A vigil for a 20-year-old woman shot in the head during clashes with police. Now on life support, she is the most serious casualty of the protests so far. Across the ethnically diverse country, which is also known as Burma, people are rallying against the return to military rule. They were flanked on Monday by armoured vehicles as the military increased its presence on the streets. The new rulers are also introducing a law to monitor online activity and they're threatening anyone obstructing armed forces with up to 20 years in prison. But many are defying those threats. This man said, this is a peaceful protest. We are fighting for the freedom of government staff. But more so, they want freedom for the country's deposed leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. She was due in court Monday, but her lawyer says that will now take place Wednesday. The charges against her include illegal possession of six walkie-talkies. The Nobel Peace Prize winner easily won last year's elections. The military alleges voter fraud. Her popularity is despite international condemnation of the country's deadly persecution of Rohingya Muslims since 2017. The military never actually totally stepped away from power. You know, during the so-called transition to democracy, it was never a genuine transition to, to full democracy. The military's position in government has been baked into democratic reforms made a decade ago. And so far, the response from the international community has been um, very weak. It's sort of mostly amounted to statements of concern and condemnation. Um, and we really need to move beyond that to get some practical action. Human rights groups say other nations should target the military's money by restricting foreign investment to companies controlled by the armed forces. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Still ahead, the online space is helping Canada's black community connect and why there's a growing demand. The Black Lives Matter protests of last summer following the death of George Floyd sparked a racial reckoning. The movement forced Canadians to examine the issues and obstacles people of colour face every day in this country. And for the black community, black-only spaces on YouTube, Facebook and other social media sites have emerged as forums to address concerns and to heal. The purpose of these spaces isn't to exclude anyone, but to offer a platform to connect over shared experiences. Candace Daniel explains. I remember every time when I went to swimming lessons, it was my hair. For Kimberly West, her anxieties around the pool started at a young age. I would be in a class, all the other kids are white, and when they're finished swimming, they got to just leave. When I was finished swimming, my hair was now a big puff. The struggle is real for black women and girls who want to swim, and it's a concern only they know. The chlorine and the extreme heat, typically used for styling black hair, creates a recipe for damage that can cause breakage and hair loss. So for most black women, there's no such thing as a quick dip in the pool. Her experience inspired Kimberly to create Black Women Swim a Facebook group where black women can find classes and share their fears about the water. Because the next generation needs to see us swimming so that it becomes that much easier for them to be willing to swim as well. There is a growing number of black only spaces that provide the community with the freedom to create, express themselves and to network. Tennille Spencer has been running a t-shirt business for four years and believes these spaces are important to help other black entrepreneurs. So it's not about, you know, division. It's about supporting those who need it the most. And I would think that everyone in the, in the community would want to do the same. I'm also someone who's lived this experience and can speak to my lived experience of it. Khadija Mboe's YouTube channel has grown from 97 subscribers in June to more than 180,000 followers today. She tackles social issues like racial bias, colorism, and privilege having black only spaces it gives the black people in them the space to not only explore who they are meet other people enjoy whatever but also to not feel like they're being watched and the open exchange with her audience has given her channel the momentum to keep growing a lot of black people that i know especially in the comments that i get on a lot of the videos 
so many of them are Black women that are just like, oh my God, thank you. Kimberly West's Facebook page is still growing, but she hopes others know it's a space to share experiences. And let's actually demonstrate and try to go against the stereotype that Black women don't swim. Creating a greater sense of awareness and an opportunity for Black Canadians to let their hair down and even get it wet if they want to. Candace Daniel, Global News, Toronto. That story is part of Global's new online initiative called Perspectives. The site features stories reflecting Canada's diverse population. Check it out at globalnews.ca slash perspectives. Is it over yet? The world's longest hockey game next. You'd better bundle up if you live in southern parts of Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Environment Canada warns the wind chill could make it feel like minus 45 tonight. Heavy snow is also expected to blanket southern Quebec by morning. There are winter storm warnings from B.C. right through to Newfoundland and Labrador. It's freezing in Alberta as well, but that didn't stop a group of hockey players near Edmonton from braving the bitter cold to set a record for the world's longest hockey game. The -the around-the-clock game lasted 252 hours and finished at 6 a.m. this morning. 40 players risked frostbite in temperatures that plunged to minus 40. It was so cold at one point, pucks shattered and skate blades snapped in two. I'm very proud of of the the people that uh, rallied around and did everything that was necessary to make this happen. It It was a bit of a skeleton crew this year. The event has raised $1.84 million and counting. The money will help support cancer research at the University of Alberta. And that is Global National for this Monday night. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is this hot air balloon over High River, Alberta. Thank you for watching. Donna Friesen will be back here tomorrow. Have a great night.